<laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our January 27th, 2023 meeting of the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board. I hope your year is off to a good start. Um, this is our second hybrid meeting of the board following, um, and I welcome all of you who have joined us here at the Capitol and online to our virtual audience here. Members of the public uh, can view this meeting via a live stream on the board's YouTube channel. Um, a recording of the meeting will remain available there after the meeting. As we begin, I want to uh, welcome Hannah Hills to her first meeting as a member of the board. As we previewed last meeting, uh, Ms. Hills has been appointed by Mayor Carter, and since the last meeting has been confirmed by the St. Paul City Council, um, uh, Hannah also has uh, her sidekick along with her uh, today, Harrison, and we're very excited um, that there is a baby in the cap board meeting. Um, <laughs> they are always welcome. <laughs> Um, I also am really excited to uh, welcome our even newer board member, uh, Representative Cleborn, who's been, been appointed by the speaker this week. Um, so thank you so much. We're so excited to have you. Um, we're also still awaiting the appointment of the, of, uh, the legislative members. Sen Senator Pappas and Nelson are uh, unable to join us today, although Senator Pappas may be able to participate a little bit online. Um, we will see. I know uh, the Senate is quite busy today. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we are still, um, we are also continuing along um, with Representative Freiburg until a formal appointment uh, can be made by House and Senate leaders. Uh, we will dive into introductions here to establish quorum. And since we have some new members, as I call the roll, uh, each of you can please briefly introduce yourself and a fun icebreaker uh, to share. Um, nobody, there's no trust falls, there's no human pretzels, nothing like that. Um, we are just going to do. Um, your favorite memory from a frozen lake. I love it. Good job. <laughs> 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 oh, that, that moment. Oh. So uh, I will uh, go first. Uh, I'm Peggy Flanagan. I'm the Lieutenant Governor, the Chair of the Cat Board meeting. And my favorite memory on a frozen lake is bringing a friend who has who is not from Minnesota out on a frozen lake and listening to the cracks and the conversation that the lake will have and was freaking out the entire time. And I was like, I promise that you're going to be okay. Um, <laughs> so quite fun. And, um, and I will turn it over to you, Executive Secretary. Is that right? Uh, I think you can do the board, board first. Okay, so we'll go this way. We'll go counterclockwise. Uh, Representative Cleaver, and we'll start with you if that's all right. Uh, thank you. Yes. And I might have been that person. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I am State Representative Jenny Cleborn. I uh, am serve District 42B, which is Plymouth, the eastern part of Plymouth and Medicine Lake. So there are some interesting pieces uh, of history there for uh, us to consider as we go forward with all of our work. And then um, my favorite memory uh, being on a frozen lake for the first time, I moved to Minnesota from Sao Paulo, Brazil. <laughs> and so First time I saw cars on the lake, I'm like, what the heck? Who drives your who drives your <laughs> car? And then I saw villages coming up on lakes, and I was like, who does this? And then I was invited out to the lake. And um, having been held up at gunpoint in Sao Paulo, the first time I heard the ice pop, I thought I was going to have, uh, I thought it was a gun. And so it was very startling. And But it gave everyone else so much humor and the greatest gift I have is the ability to laugh at myself. And so we just had a great time. It was a, a really fun time. And hot chocolate with schnapps was something I was introduced to. Right. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Right uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Alicia Belton. Um, I'm serving, um, this is my second term on the board. And um, I would say one of my more recent uh, fun memories of being on a lake is actually during the pandemic. Um, my husband and I took up snowshoeing, and so we um, we're urban snowshoers, so haven't done any like deep parks or anything like that. But on Lake of the Isles, so um, just uh, it's fun to um, be able to get closer to that little island in the middle. And um, yeah, so that was uh, kind of a, a fun thing for us to do. We thought our kids would like to join us, and they did not. And so that was <laughs> Sunday, afternoon outings uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, wonderful. That's a great. Hannah Hills, um, community member from the Capitol Heights Block Club. So very nice to see all of you. 
Um, I do have to leave a little early today to speak. Okay. Um, and when you said frozen, like the first memory that popped in my head was shortly after moving back from college and then spending a year in Spain, I was at my mom's house and she lives across from two lakes. And I woke up one morning, like, I'm just going to go for a walk because I had been in California and Spain without any frozen lakes. <laughs> so but it was just a really beautiful morning with the sunrise. And that's the first thing I thought of. Perfect. Wonderful. Hey, good morning, James McLean. Um, four minutes, and I don't recall how long, because time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's see, I'm, I, I've been, I'm searching my memory banks for uh, a positive um, frozen mixture. I cannot find it. I love the hard lakes in Minnesota, but I enjoy them as much as I can up until the fall, and then I stay. <laughs> summer. Uh, and the only thing that came to mind is what my my alley, which feels like a frozen deck sometimes, but it's never in the stuck in there a couple of times. So that wasn't the draw. That wasn't the draw. That was the draw. That was the draw. That's what I think of a frozen deck. I think that's the best draw. It feels like I'm on my own. We'll take it. <laughs> Ms. Badger. Oh, okay. I'm Dana Badger. I'm a public member. I'm in my first term, former commissioner of administration twice on the Capital Restoration Board. I avoid frozen lakes like the plague. <laughs> Fair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and Dr. Bean, are you, can you introduce yourself? I can. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Kate Bean here. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Museum of American Art. Um, thought I would be able to join you in person, but professional development day at my kids' school hit. Knowledge of that hit just yesterday because I don't read calendars apparently, so my apologies for not being <laughs> there in person. Um, my favorite memory of a frozen lake, uh, I would I would say my family, we have a deep, long, um, and very beloved history at Bidet Makaska, and I think the first time that I took my daughters out to write messages in the middle of frozen Bidet Makaska mm -hmm. and the look on their faces that they could do that and, and do that at home was absolutely wonderful, and I, I just, it's a, it's a great memory that I had. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bean. Uh, Mr. Yang. Good morning, folks. Daniel Yang with Mayor Melvin Carter's office. Uh, I think my favorite memory is growing up, uh, going up to Mille Lacs and ice fishing with my grandpa. Um, not catching a whole lot of fish, but spending a lot of quality time with him up there. Awesome. It's not really about the fish. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay. And I think we're good on forum. Yeah, and now we'll have staff introduce yourself. So go ahead. <laughs> Barrett Clapsmith, I'm Executive Secretary of the CAP Board. Happy to see you all and have some new members at the table. Well, Peter Musty, I'm a Principal Planner and Zoning Administrator for the CAP Board. I do have to mention uh, Frozen Lakes. Hockey Day Minnesota is uh, this week, uh, so, and I'm, I'm a hockey coach and uh, looking forward to celebrating with the rest of Minnesota. Wonderful. Okay. Good morning. I'm Laura Dotson. I'm the part-time office assistant here at the CAT board. Good to see you, Laura. Okay. Oh, and Danita, go ahead and introduce yes, yourself, please. I'm Danita Lemon. I'm architectural CAT board advisor. Thank you. Hello, Michael Yarnberg, uh, architectural advisor. Okay. Um, so a quorum is uh, present. And first, we will discuss the election of board officers. It has been the recent practice of the board to select a smaller executive committee uh, that staff can consult with in between meetings on operational issues. In statute, we are also allowed but not required to select a vice chair who can preside in my absence and elect other officers necessary uh, to carry out uh, these duties. Um, in your packet, you have a memo from the executive secretary proposing that we select a vice chair and two other members to form an executive committee that would meet quarterly between board meetings to provide advice to board staff, but without any broader authority uh, to act on our behalf. Um, and executive secretary, if you can 
um, lead us through that. Yes, you have more on this? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have been on a number of boards myself, and I have always found it um, really helpful. Uh, the role that the executive committee plays on the board, um, helping to work with staff, just talking through some of the operational issues, things coming up to the board, making sure we're anticipating getting information that the board members need, uh, and just kind of being a more regular conduit of communication between the board and staff. So I, I recommend um, that we go ahead and uh, have you appoint a couple of committee members. Under, under statute, uh, we are only required to have um, the chair, and we can have a vice chair and executive committee, other executive committee members. There is no further definition than that. Um, so I'm wondering, I think, Ms. Badgero, you have expressed some interest in uh, being the vice chair. Um, is that still the still the case? I'd be just delighted to do so. I work regularly with the mayor, and I think it'll be fun working with her closely. The only thing I'm intimidated by is the preparing a board policy manual. <laughs> I, I'm assuming that that's probably yeah. the case. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, are, are there any, is anyone else interested in putting your name into consideration? James? Yeah, you said that. Um, seemingly slightly done, but awesome staff, so I feel like I don't have anything to worry about. So okay. I would be, I would put my name forward. Great. So we've got uh, Dana and James, you're also, uh, Mr. McLean, you're also interested in being the vice chair. Oh, I'm sorry, not vice chair. So okay. I All good. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All good. All good. So um, just want to check one more time if anyone else is interested in putting uh, their name in for the vice chair. If not, okay, I would uh, entertain a motion to elect uh, Dana Badgero as our vice chair of the cap board. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay. Um, we can do, thank you, um, we can do a roll call here. Uh, with that, I will take the roll. Uh, Ms. Badgero. Aye. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bean. Aye. Uh, Ms. Felton. Aye. Uh, Ms. Hills. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Uh, Mr. Yang. Aye. And I vote aye. Um, and you are now the vice chair. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you um, after being uh, in this role for four years and now moving into a second term. I appreciate the assist. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and now we can uh, transition into James. I like how eager you are. Um, I appreciate that. Um, is, uh, is anyone else, uh, Mr. McLean, is interested in serving um, on the executive committee? Uh, the chair has recommended there's uh, two additional board members. Um, if anyone else would be interested in serving uh, in that role, um, we would uh, entertain that now. Would anyone else like to put their names forward? And once you hear back from, from these two about how great it is, I'm sure. <laughs> That's right. Want to step forward in my life. We also can wait on it, and I think if it's okay, we can um, elect uh, Mr. McLean uh, to the executive board, executive committee of the board. Does that work? Okay. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and uh, do that. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Wonderful. Um, with that, we can take the roll. Um, Ms. Badgero? Aye. Dr. Bean? Aye. Ms. Felton. Aye. Ms. Hills. Aye. Representative Fleamorn. Aye. Mr. McLean. Mr. Yang. Aye. And I, the chair, vote aye. Congratulations, Mr. McLean, and thank you for your willingness to serve on the executive committee. Wonderful. Okay. And, um, you know, if you are so moved, you sit up in bed in the middle of the night and you're like, oh, I really should have joined the executive committee. Just let us know. We can make it happen. Okay. 
Um, so our next item of business relates to the placement of bus rapid transit uh, stations in the capital area. As a public transit enthusiast, uh, it is so exciting that we soon will be served by three new BRT lines in the capital area. Um, and this is an amazing, beautiful place and space and sometimes a little hard to get to. So I'm excited uh, for these lines. We have two approvals to consider here today outlined uh, in a memo from Principal Planner uh, Musty. Mr. Musty, can you please go ahead and also introduce our guest? You bet, thank you so much. Um, and so thanks, Madam Chair. This is the first of a few bus rapid transit actions uh, that you may be taking in the coming years. It's Metro Transit working closely uh, within planning groundwork of Ramsey County and other counties, but our, our Ramsey County it implements a more complete network of bus rapid transit lines connecting our region. Some of that infrastructure is in the capital area. We have Frank Allercone, um, a BRT project manager for Metro Transit, who will give us an overview of the network improvements. After that, we will be considering the design and location approvals of stations now in design. Uh, Frank was uh, last with us about a little over a year ago to update you about Purple Line stationary planning when he was with the county. He is now with Metro Transit. Uh, with your permission, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to Frank for his overview. Please go ahead, Mr. Alicone. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and Mr. Musty. I'm looking forward to sharing some updates this morning about bus rapid transit projects in our region and in the capital area. Next slide, please. So just some basic information to start about bus rapid transit and kind of what makes it a premium form of transit service. So um, bus rapid transit is, is generally faster and provides a better customer uh, experience than conventional bus service. And it does that in a number of ways. For one, stations are spread out a little bit farther apart, usually about two or three stations per mile. So the bus isn't stopping as often, which creates a faster ride. Uh, the stations are, are really high quality. They offer uh, passengers with a, a significant degree of comfort and protection. So there's a shelter, uh, there are numerous um, security cameras, there's real-time information so you can see when the next bus is coming. Um, passengers uh, pay their fare at the station platform rather than on the bus, which really speeds up the boarding process. Um, also, they can board through all doors of the bus, not just at the front, which similarly speeds up that process. Um, another thing that speeds up bus rapid transit is bus priority signals at intersections. So um, buses can communicate with signal systems to get a longer green light or a shorter red light to keep them moving. And then um, lastly, something that, that our customers really appreciate about bus rapid transit is that it's, it's frequent service. So it runs generally every 10 to 15 minutes, uh, frequently enough that you don't necessarily need to check a schedule. You can just show up at a station and um, be assured that a bus is on its way. Next slide, please. So Metro Transit is working on uh, a whole integrated network of bus rapid transit um, corridors that are, are going to extend into many communities throughout our metro area. So um, there are either there are 12 bus rapid transit lines that either exist today already or will exist by 2030 in this map um, shows all of them. And uh, three of those 12 will directly serve uh, the capital area. Those are the B line, the purple line, and the G line. And I'll have some more information on those three projects in just a minute. Next slide, please. So uh, thinking forward almost 20 years to 2040, um, when we have these bus rapid transit projects implemented, as well as our light rail projects, um, we're going to see some really significant benefits for our region. So. 77% um, of the residents of Minneapolis and St. Paul are going to be uh, living within a half mile of one of our high frequency metro uh, bus rapid transit or light rail lines. Um, that 30% um, uh, of the region's households similarly will be within half a mile of this system. And that includes 60% of uh, renter households in the region and 60% of zero car households, as well as almost half of the low income households in our region and about 44% of jobs. So a lot of the people, a lot of the jobs in our region are going to be within a short walk of the metro system um, once we've implemented it over the next um, um, couple of years and decades. Next slide, please. 
So now I'll transition to talking about the three projects that will directly serve the capital area. Next slide. So starting with the B line, this one will be under construction uh, in, this year. Um, so the Metro B line is an upgrade to the Route 21 corridor. This is Metro Transit's second highest ridership bus route. It serves the Lake Street, uh, Marshall Avenue, and Selby Avenue corridors between uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, about 106,000 people live within a 10 minute walk or about a half mile of the B-Line corridor that you see on the screen. Uh, about 42% of those folks are BIPOC. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, construction will be starting this year, uh, extending into 2024, and we're looking to start service on the B-Line toward the end of 2024. And there will be one station uh, of the B-Line that's within the, the capital area, and that's the John Ireland and Marshall station. Next slide, please. Here's just a little more um, kind of an aerial view of, of that John, John Ireland and Marshall Station. You can see um, both the uh, eastbound and westbound platforms. They're really more situated north south here um, as the, the line transitions from Selby into downtown Minneapolis. Um, the, these stations provide really great access to St. Paul College, uh, which is a really key destination along the B line. Next slide, please. Uh, this graphic shows the general uh, design of our uh, bus rapid transit on our arterial bus rapid transit system. So the, the arterial lines are the ones that start with letters. Um, so the, the, the B line is one of them. Um, and you can see kind of some of the signature features of an arterial bus rapid transit station uh, in this image. And, and you'll um, once, once the station at John Ireland and Marshall is constructed, it'll have these features. So you can see the shelter, uh, the pylon sign, which contains uh, security cameras and the real-time information, uh, as well as there's seating, there's the ticket vending, there's bike racks for people who ride their bikes to the, to the station. So uh, this general style will be what's reflected in, in that station design uh, in the capital area. Next slide, please. So that's the B-line. Um, uh, another of the bus rapid transit projects that will be uh, directly serving the capital area is the Metro Purple Line. So the Metro Purple Line will serve St. Paul and uh, suburban communities in the Northeast Metro. Uh, along that corridor, uh, more than half the population is BIPOC, 20% um, uh, is low income households and 12% of households uh, don't have a vehicle. Uh, construction on the Purple Line is ex expected to start in 2025 with service starting in 2027. And currently the Purple Line is in its design phase. The route, uh, the route map you see here is the, the current adopted uh, locally preferred alternative, which is just kind of jargon for route. Um, and next slide, please. The, the route is uh, is potentially going to change uh, for the purple line. So there's a there's a study underway that Metro Transit is is leading in, in partnership with Ramsey County and other um, communities along the line to uh, potentially change the northern end of the purple line uh, in response to feedback from the White Bear Lake City Council last year. And so currently there are three potential purple line um, and end of the line uh, locations uh, under consideration. So there's uh, I-35E and County Road E, there's Maplewood Mall Transit Center and Century College. And there's there's going to be some community engagement and public involvement in this study uh, later this year. Next slide, please. Uh, regardless of the outcome of that route modification study, there will be two Purple Line stations located right in the, in the capital area. Uh, there's the 14th Street Station. Uh, which will be on 14th Street, right between the Green Line Station and Regents Hospital. So this will be a station that people both use uh, to transfer to the Green Line to head further west, as well as to access jobs in the capital area, um, such as state jobs, as well as the, the many healthcare jobs associated with Regions and Gillette and other healthcare providers in the area. Um, the other station located in the capital area on the Purple Line is the Mount Airy Street Station. Uh, this will serve the Capitol Heights area and Mount Airy. Uh, the station will be along Jackson Street um, at the intersection of the Mount Airy slash Winter Street. Um, next slide, please. 
Lastly, uh, the, the third and final uh, bus rapid transit station that will be serving the capital area is the Metro G line. So this is another one of the arterial bus rapid transit lines like the B line. Uh, the G line will substantially upgrade the existing routes uh, 62 and 68 along the Rice Street and Robert Street corridors in St. Paul and into the suburb, uh, various suburban communities such as Little Canada and uh, West St. Paul. 43% um, of current riders of these routes are uh, people of color or live in low income households. The G line pr will provide access to over 74,000 jobs. And uh, currently it's in uh, the pretty early stages of planning. Uh, the station locations have not been set yet for the G line, um, but Metro Transit is preparing to uh, later this year, um, share recommendations for G line stations and collect public input about that. And the cap board, um, cap board staff is being involved uh, regularly in the G line planning process um, this year, as well as um, starting last year. Uh, the G-Line project is also coordinating with other transportation improvements going on in the corridor, such as improvements to Rice Street that are being led by Ramsey County and improvements to Robert Street that are uh, being led by St. Paul um, and the Minnesota Department of Transportation. So there's a lot of partnerships that happen along these corridors to kind of maximize the benefits to communities along them. Next slide, please. So that was a lot of information about three different projects. So I'll just take a pause here and um, see if there are any questions before I hand it back to Mr. Musty. Thanks, Go ahead, uh, Representative Cleemore. Uh, thank you. Um, I was looking at figure five and six in our packet, which is on page five of nine. And um, my question, I understand that these markers on the picture may not be where the actual station will occur, but on the parking lot side of that picture, I thought to myself, it's, uh, I understand traffic flow and not wanting to block the intersection or anything like that, but I'm wondering if that uh, transit station on the parking lot side could be as close to the hospital as possible so that anyone who would be in need of those services would have the least walk possible going there. I understand the tree line side could be more difficult because of the direction of the traffic flow, but um, is there a, just a standard that that has to be placed from the intersection? Um, thanks so, for the question. Thanks for the question, um, Representative. So, um, it, the the placement of that station was uh, definitely something we looked at closely. Um, it is it landed where it is for a number of reasons. We wanted it to be accessible both to the Green Line station and the hospital, um, and and we do find that it's within a good uh, a short distance of both in this location. Um, to put it any closer to the intersection at Jackson could potentially cause some challenges. Uh, making the left turn onto Jackson to continue on its way um, up uh, north along Jackson and into um, the Capitol Heights area and then further into the east side of St. Paul. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. McLean. Um, just uh, and thanks for that question. I, I'm not on the task board representing health partners, but in my day job, I, I work for health partners and, and Regents Hospital and I uh, appreciate that question and, and kind of the work that has been thought that is done because uh, there's certainly a lot of both employees and patients that would use that to access uh, care at Reading Hospital and actually a lot of the healthcare facilities uh, along that line. So I um, really appreciate that uh, thoughtfulness in that question. Um, but my my question is, I mean, I, I realize this was an update on BRT lines. And I'm just curious because um, I've heard some about a, let's see, uh, Riverview corridor or, or a streetcar that will go from um, you know, downtown and then south eventually to Bloomington. I'm just curious if that, um, just the timing of that um, project, is that something that would <coughs> that um, would come before the cap board? I can't, I don't know exactly how close to the capital that line would be. Just curious, any comments on that and, and timing, how that fits into this broader picture of, of transit lines? Sir, yeah, I'll I think, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and Mr. McLean. Um, if we could go back a few slides to the um, to the 2040 Metro Network map, that would be helpful. 
Thank you. Uh, one, uh, yes, the, the one with all the green. Uh, so yeah, you can see the Riverview corridor on this on this map along along West Seventh Street, and so that project is currently being led by Ramsey County. It's uh, in kind of a preliminary design phase. So it it is part of our uh, 2040 network, meaning we we do expect that that project to be implemented by 2040. Um, likely not by 2030. There's still a lot of design work um, and, and design issues to resolve um, before that period of time. Um, the the Riverview corridor doesn't uh, extend, doesn't cross the, the the boundary quite into the capital area. It'll um, transition from West Seventh Street uh, onto Fifth and Sixth Street in downtown, just south of the capital area. Um, but nonetheless, it, it will connect to. Um, all of the lines that that I talked about earlier, the B line, the the purple line, and the G line. So um, the the corridors will will work together as a system. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, um, for me, yeah, hand it back to Peter, Mr. Musty. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Frank, for the overview. Um, and hang on. Well, might need you. Um, <laughs> I'll express appreciation um, also to your large teams. Uh, B line, uh, I know you're representing several lines here B line, the G line, and the purple line teams for continuing to include us in the technical advisory meetings and then for submitting the design information necessary to review the proposed design and locations we are considering today. As you've read in your memo, the CAP board must approve transit stations. For both design and location. Here in the case of John Ireland uh, on the B line and Martin, John Ireland on Marshall Station, a well used bus shelter is already in place. You can see St. Paul College and Cathedral, of course, um, and some apartments across the street, leading you to Summit here on John Ireland. So in this case, we all, what, all, all we must approve, since there is a bus station here now already located, is the design of the upgraded station. Uh, as explained by Frank, the station design being proposed for John Ireland Marshall is the standard station design found throughout the region for arterial BRT stops. This is a built example at 10 and 43rd in Minneapolis. The typical features of arterial BRT stations include several features that increase comfort, security, access, and an interactive screen embedded in the familiar Metro Transit beacon. Um, I have a very similar station in my neighborhood. The heat lamp and the shelter is my favorite feature. <laughs> As many of you know, the curbs are often a bit higher to allow easier access for everyone, especially those on wheels. The pay stations allow you to take care of transactions ahead of time, like on LRT trains. And so at this time, Madam Chair, it would be a good time to offer any remaining questions before entertaining suggested any additional questions for Mr. Musty or for Mr. Alarcon? Okay, yes. I said oh, yes. Yes. like <laughs> over big overview question. Um, with the the past few years on the Green Line, um, having issues with people experiencing homelessness um, and people, um, yeah, using almost using it like a like a shelter. Um, I'm curious if there is coordinated planning going on with any other city um, or state agencies as you consider adding more public transport to um, at the same time be ramping up other types of services for people. Um, just because it, this is really great, but if it's not going to also address other issues um, I'm just curious what that looks like uh, at this. This might not be the level to ask that question. <laughs> but, like that's fine. And okay. I don't know, Mr. Messi, I will take a crack at that if Absolutely. you don't mind. Um, yeah, for, for sure. So I am also the um, the co-chair of the Minnesota Interagency um, on Homelessness as well. And uh, we have been, um, Ramsey County has been an incredible partner, as has the city of St. Paul. Um, in our budget that we just released uh, this week, uh, you will see $1.5 billion um, that has been dedicated to housing and homelessness, in particular, emergency services providers 
shelters um, and other services for our, our neighbors experiencing homelessness. So I think um, that combined uh, with being strategic with our partners, I think gives me a lot of hope for what is, is possible. Um, and I don't wanna get ahead of my skis, um, but I like our chances uh, in being able to pass these things um, in the legislature, but it is certainly something that we think about often. Um, and uh, Met Council um, uh, has been, and Metro Transit law enforcement has also been um, uh, really good partners with us there too. So I absolutely hear you and I think there's more to come. And that's certainly something I think we all, um, we all share uh, values around making sure that everyone has a safe place to go and they don't have to rely on transit um, for shelter. So thank you for that question. I appreciate that question. Very much. Uh, Ms. Cleveland, Representative Cleveland. Okay. Um, my question is more about our uh, visually impaired uh, community, our community that has visual impairment. It's a better way for me to say it. Um, do these stations have uh, any supports for them um, as they come into the capital area? Mr. Musty or Mr. Alarcon? Alarcon, Mr. Alarcon. Mr. Alarcon, go right ahead. Sure, thank you, uh, Representative and, and Lieutenant Governor. Uh, yes, they do. Um, so they have a number of accessibility features. Um, uh, specifically, um, they have on the on the pylon sign, which is toward the left of um, of this image, there are push button enunciators that announce uh, the real time signage information that's also just dis displayed on the screen. So um, if, if folks can't see that screen, they can push that button and um, and listen for uh, the information about when the next buses will be coming. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Any additional questions? Yes, Mr. McLean. Um, just a general question about the, um, uh, I'm not as familiar with the, with the BRT lines, but along the LRT, a lot of the um, stations have kind of individualized art. Um, and I was just curious at kind of the, at what point is that kind of discussed and would this uh, have some kind of capital related art or, or exhibit? Um, and can what would that, would we worry about that at some point? Just curious on how to process the beyond the, the basic kind of features of standard features of the station's kind of individual art or something like that. That's a great question and that I don't have the answer to, Mr. Musty. I will take a shot at that. Thank you. I will need <laughs> Mr. Alarcon's assistance. Um, since the LRT planning, it is my understanding that art is not uh, able to be incorporated directly into federally funded projects, Mr. Alarcon, is Frank, is that, is that? That is correct, yeah. Federal, federal law changed, I believe, in 2013 to make art no longer an eligible um, um, fund item for federal funding in a transit project. Having said that, the LRT stations that we do enjoy um, have been in um, uh, executive se former executive secretary Mandel, uh, maybe at another time, could speak to that process, which mm -hmm. is very extensive about incorporating local art and local cultural history in in each station, all, all the way out to like Bloomington with the mm -hmm. digital. I mean, it's, it's it was quite an extensive project. Those things were not asked um, here because of the potential delay in funding, mm -hmm. expense, and complication. There are um, settings nearby that we should um, make sure that we're future proofing. Um, and as we do stationary planning in the purple line, we will certainly mark that down as something to, talk, to ask about, Mr. McLean. Yes, Secretary, go ahead. Thank you. I, I was just wondering if you have a federally funded station, but somebody wants to contribute money to add some sort of artistic element to it is that possible or are they essentially prohibited from having public art mr allercone could you address that yes thank you for that question my understanding is that if other funding sources are identified that does potentially make it possible to incorporate artistic elements either into the station itself or you know directly adjacent to a station Representative Cleborn, and then I'm going to move us right along here. <laughs> yeah, point, you know, on page seven, it, it gives us a little bit of Q&A about mm -hmm. these pieces. So 
but I was thinking about it in terms of a comprehensive plan, right? So in this particular area, part of that capital plan says that we must be thinking about the grandeur mm -hmm. of the setting that we're in. And so I was thinking if we can't have art, to Mr. Musky's point earlier, we need to think about the timeline to allow the um, station itself to be the art mm -hmm. and then work that into the budgeting process as we go forward. And, um, you know, I realize that it's a bus station, <laughs> but it can be beautiful. Mm -hmm. It can be a beautiful bus station mm -hmm. as well for the people to enjoy if it's to be the people's front yard. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Musty. I'm just going to state that we have that opportunity now looking forward to purple yeah. line planning, mm -hmm. stationary, which includes stationary planning as a gateway corridor, and then um, also with the station location process happening here on the D-line, which are, you know, quarters that are very important. Jackson and Rice Street are very important um, uh, that the comp plan is addressed and we've given a lot of thought to. So I think it'd be very appropriate to talk about that and bring that into station airport. Thank you. Ms. Badger, did you have a question? I didn't. No, okay. Sorry, okay. I was ready to make a motion. Wonderful. <laughs> Are there any more questions? I think it's a great discussion and an opportunity for us as we are moving forward, if that's what we decide to do today. Uh, Ms. Badro. I just think I want to commend the staff. This staff memo is very thorough. And I love the pictures. I think mm -hmm. it's a good representation of what these stations will look like. And I think they're quite dignified and comfortable. Uh, so I will move approval of the resolution as well as the letter of support that is uh, included in the memo. Um, I would ask if it is all right, if we can, to your motion, Ms. Badger, do them separately. Yes. Do the first resolution, and then we'll do the second one. I, I move the resolution. Thank you. And now I will take the roll. Uh, Ms. Badger. Aye. Dr. Bean. Aye. Ms. Belton. Aye. Ms. Hills. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Mr. Yang. Aye. And I vote aye. And now let's go ahead right. to the purple line. So the, uh, <laughs> the approval of a letter of support that is included in the packet. Are there, uh, so uh, it has been moved. Is there a second? I think that's a couple of slides from that. I think we have, I think we have a little bit more. We have another set of stations to talk about. Oh, sorry. I got it. I'm myself. sorry. You're pre meeting. <laughs> That's right. Okay. All right. So this first resolution, which is completed. Um, uh, Peter. Yeah. So P uh, Peter, there's a second uh, draft resolution you put on screen. Absolutely. Thank you. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, there's a couple slides explaining the second approval, which is uh, loca station locations on the purple line over on Jackson. So thank you, Madam Chair. Now we're, we're the, the tension on two station locations. Over on the purple line, runs from Robert downtown up into the east campus, turning in front of 14th Street ramp, and then northward up Jackson through St. Paul to the south north, eventually ending in White Bear Lake, as Frank mentioned earlier. There have been two technical analyses completed by the county, and then more recently by Metro Transit engineers. Both rounds concluded with identification of the location shown, which is centered between the job centers in the capital complex and regions, while still being around the corner from the LRT station. The location closer to Jackson allows for minimal disruption to entries to the parking facility, specifically located away from the entry to 14th Street Grant. Here you see the proposed station location on 14th Street. The photo is taken very close to where entries are located to the ramp on the left and surface lots W and U to the right. Some land may be taken from state lot W, but the amount is yet to be determined. This has been reviewed and okayed so far by the Department of Administration through Cap Although Cap Board staff is working to ensure that administration is consulted closely by Purple Line engineers as we go. Location of the station simply signals uh, that Cap Board supports the location chosen. Board consideration of the detailed station design is still ahead and will follow further rounds of station design. But also will come after stationary planning is underway or has been completed for the area around it. 
please note that this is an approval of a location only and allows the planners to move ahead with station design. Okay, and with that, uh, okay. The second station mm -hmm. location in the capital area proposed for the Metro Purple Line is northward on Jackson at Mount Airy in winter. This will serve the housing at the Mount Airy neighborhood, the Capitol Heights neighborhood in the capital area, and the new hospital. The station locations are both north of the intersection. The rule of thumb for station designers is that the far side locations are in general preferable to avoid getting caught at red lights. In this case, the southbound station was moved north to the near side of the intersection due to the inaccessible slopes as you move south, which often makes the rating difficult and expensive for those platforms at the stations. The exact design of the station here will be a subject of interagency collaboration as the city will reconcile long range goals for Jackson with the needs for station design at the intersection. Capport is hopeful the station area planning will allow us to address planning issues in the neighborhood that are due. That share of plan again. Any questions on station locations before we move to the resolution? Ms. Felton, a question. So um, I'm assuming that neighborhood engagement was already done in citing these two in this community from Mount Gary and Jackson. Mr. Mustin. Um, station area planning yep. and station engagement is ahead. Oh, okay. The idea is that we will um, look at the location on a technical level and, and approve that, but the refinement of the station design is ahead while engagement will happen. So it's an iterative with stationary plan. Any additional questions? Okay. May I now renew my motion? My yes, Ms. Badger. Sorry, I <laughs> can do. Earlier. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Being moved and seconded, uh, I will now take the roll. Ms. Badgerow. Ms. Uh, Dr. Bean. Aye. Ms. Belton. Aye. Ms. Hills. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Mr. Yang. Aye. And I, as the chair, vote aye. Thank you. It passes. In your packet, there's a proposed uh, statement of support for federal grants. The city of St. Paul is submitting uh, to update uh, Jackson Street. Mr. Mus Musty, can you please provide just a little bit of context for us for this letter? Thank you. Yes, letters of support for projects seeking federal funding, such as raise grants, can often make the difference in an application scoring higher. The following statement of support for BRT planning by the board will be helpful to our interagency partners, such as the city of St. Paul, in seeking support for resources related to street improvements in locations where BRT stations are proposed. The opportunity directly ahead is that BRT improvements at those intersections can be designed more holistically within a vision for a larger repair or improvement to Jackson specifically. This will help maximize the value of BRT investments here in the capital area and potentially make the project even better for residents, visitors, and commuters. Uh, we'll just add that um, this is will enable the planning, the, the stationary planning with the community that is ahead to actually have funds at the back end. So this support is early in the process, enabling us to actually be designing something that will go in the ground rather than just kind of pie in the sky. So this is directly helpful for those um, uh, support funds. Any questions, Representative Cleborn? Um, I would just like to ask if the CAP uh, board is reaching out to the legislators for this district. I know when we were applying for uh, these grants for the city of Plymouth and Minneapolis for a BRT along the 55 corridor, we provided letters of support for that as well. So um, in order to be more successful, I would encourage that. Joy, more of a comment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Messi. Quick response is absolutely. We are not uh, filing the, the, the city will be. Okay. And I'm sure that they will be, but I'll we'll make sure to mention that. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, hey, is there a motion to approve the statement of support? So moved. Thank you. A second. second and a second. There's a motion and a second. I will now take the roll. Uh, Ms. Badger? Aye. Dr. Bean? Aye. 
Ms. Felton. Aye. Ms. Hills. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Mr. Yang. Aye. And I, as the chair, vote aye. Thank you. Um, that is now completed, and uh, we had um, several things that we just took care of there. Thank you, Mr. Rusty. Um, Mr. Alarcon, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, so as the executive secretary has updated you all via email, there is a planning for a renovation of the state office building uh, underway. Although uh, we do not have to take any action as a board today, uh, Ms. Clapp-Smith will talk us through some of the information presented uh, to the House Rules Committee in December, along with the role that our board may play. Please go ahead, Ms. Clapp-Smith. Yes, thank you very much. So many of you might have seen um, Middle of December, the House Rules Committee approved um, a design concept for the state office building, which would entail um, long overdue renovations to the existing structure in an addition to meet different needs that have been identified by the tenants of the building. The committee voted to adopt the design concept and a recommended program for how the spaces in the building would be allotted and a budget for the project. The condition of the state office building, as I understand, has been deteriorating for many years and the investment to address the issues is thoroughly needed. So issue identification during the scoping of the project uh, revealed a host of needs that the design team felt could not be fully accomplished within the current footprint of the building. Next. So I'm going to talk you through a few steps that led us here today. Uh, in July of 2021, in a special session, uh, legislation was passed that gave um, approval for design work to begin. Um, to address the needs of the state office building um, and a budget for that to happen. A needs assessment and design for rehab of the existing building um, was started in 2022, I believe. And uh, at some point later on, um, around the third quarter of last year, there was a decision was made that there was a need to explore an addition in order to meet all of the identified needs for the building. The CAP board staff was first engaged uh, in November of this year when we had an opportunity to meet with uh, representatives from the Department of Administration and the State Office Building Design Team to learn about the project, the preferred design schematic, which you have seen, and considerations um, that we wanted to flag regarding comprehensive plan and zoning. Uh, after that, in uh, mid-December, I had an opportunity to be introduced to Representative uh, Portman, the now Speaker of the House, and that was arranged by Paul Mandel, my predecessor. And among various topics we covered, we did spend a little bit of time talking about the state office building and the role that the CAP board might be playing moving forward in our priorities. On the 21st of December, the House Rules Committee passed the approval for the design and the program and budget, as I mentioned. The design. In their language, it says the design. Uh, we had a third meeting uh, with the design team and administration in mid-January to talk more about the current design schematic and the impacts on Leaf Erickson Park. Next. So this image shows the current layout of open space and buildings on the Capitol campus. You can see the current state office building in the dark orange um, middle left of the slide. Next. So north of the building currently is Leif Erickson Park. Leif Erickson Park, um, was sort of dedicated as the Leif Erickson Park when the memorial was added in 1949. Uh, 
the statue and park have been there and open um, since that time. And it's my understanding, although we have more research to do, that before the memorial uh, entered the space, um, it had been a park for public use. That's, oh, that's the opening ceremony when uh, the memorial was added. Next. So I want all of you should have this memorized, I assume. I know I do. <laughs> um, the purposes of our board, um, just quickly want to note that um, each of these really relates to the conversations we'll be having about the state office building and um, Lee Erickson Park. Um, we need to be thinking about preserving um, the dignity of the Capitol, beauty, architectural integrity um, of the grounds and the Capitol area. Um, two, to protect, enhance, and increase the open spaces. Um, to develop proper approaches to the Capitol area for pedestrians and other forms of transportation. And to establish a flexible framework for growth. Next, please. Oh, good. That's not on my computer. Excuse me, folks. I'm, I'm, I have a technical glitch. Mm -hmm. I need a minute to fix this. Here, Peter, I can, right. I can take over the slides. If you Thank you. Do you, got, do you have the slides? Yeah. My computer is telling me it's going to restart. <laughs> that just happened to me in the middle of addressing Thousand people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not going to stop it. Yeah. It's just part of the right now. I'm sorry about that. No, we're back up already. Okay. The next slide. Switch to Eric. Here we go. Eric. Good work. All right. The next slide um, is our comprehensive plan and what it says about Leaf Erickson Park. Um, so first, I just want to note that in the rule in the statute that establishes the cap board um, one of the statements says that no construction on public land in the capital area may take place unless it is allowed um, or identified in the comprehensive plan so they need to follow the comprehensive plan uh, within our comprehensive plan there are 10 chapters and one of these chapters is the Capital Rice District as an urban village with Leif Erickson Park at its center. And I'm gonna read aloud this quote at the bottom. The Southern portion of the park currently is a surface parking lot, though the entirety of the space is zoned for preservation of open space, G2. The parking in this area is meant to be temporary. The long-term vision for the site is to be redesigned as open space. So preparation of the comp plan occurred over three years with extensive stakeholder and public input and was adopted by the board in March of 2021. Um, one of the standout elements of the plan was the vision for Leaf Erickson Park as a public square, event space, uh, transit mobility hub that would connect the Capitol campus, um, the mall to Rice Street and the community. Next, please. I just want to note that when the comprehensive plan was being prepared, um, nobody was contemplating that there might be a future proposal to expand the state office building. Um, so it was presumed that Leif Erickson Park um, would be remaining and that it would be expanded with uh, the removal of the surface parking lot. The great news about the comprehensive plan is that there are many policies in it that a state office building project can help us implement um, no matter where the exact location is um, if there is an addition and staff and our advisors are already preparing a list of all of the complementary project elements in this you will see um, the image on the left is the current comprehensive plan vision for the future Leaf Erickson Park being expanded into the surface parking lot. So you really end up there with a public square um, 
that is bordered by the Capitol steps and the Capitol, the state office building, Rice Street and a redeveloped Sears site to the west and to the north, the Senate um, <coughs> building and other properties. Today, the mall and Leif Erikson Park are two outdoor spaces on the campus that people can book for events. Between 2018 and 2022, 40 events were booked in Leif Erikson Park. Most common were rallies, followed by prayers and marches. Uh, but special note, 2022, it was twice reserved for croquet matches. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Fun. That was during COVID. People were very you safe. The mall lawn would have been better for that. Just yeah. putting that out there. <laughs> Excellent point. We'll consider that in the future. Um, it is not yet clear whether the state office building project at this point um, would propose to change the function of the open space around it. Um, would it remain a rentable event space or would it remain open to the public? So on the right, you can see. Um, the proposed state office building addition um, that currently has been put forward and the green space that would be around it. Again, we do not yet know um, what the plans for that green space would be, but the cap board um, certainly are eager to engage uh, with the design team and others in this conversation. Next, please. Uh, in addition to our comp plan, um, we have zoning. The zoning is in the comp plan. It says what land uses can occur in different parts of our 60 block capital area. Um, outlined in red, although it's a little hard to see, is a green square and that is the current Leaf Erickson Park um, and the surface parking lot. So this is zoned G2 uh, and the G2 in our rules allow open space, surface parking lots and underground structures, but they do not permit buildings. Because um, our zoning districts and the uses allowed are designated in our rules chapter, a zoning change that would enable a building to extend into this space um, would have to go through a rulemaking process. I'll also note that the city of St. Paul cannot legally issue a building permit for projects in the capital area unless the planned land use is allowed under our zoning. Next. All right, what are we, what are we looking at for next steps? Um, staff and advisors are looking forward to meetings with the state office building design team and project leads. Um, to talk about possible um, adjustments to the plan, to discuss our comp plan priorities in Lake Erickson Park. Uh, we will bring forward to the board a project design framework that kind of sets down the, uh, identifies the parameters that the board uh, wishes to see advanced on the project, and we can talk more about that um, later. We would have to, um, there would have to be an application for a zoning permit project. Uh, if the addition continues um, kind of to be the size it is and there isn't a resolution of sort of continued use of Leaf Erickson Park as envisioned in the comp plan, we will need to do amendments to our comp plan, which then sets the stage that allows rezoning. Each of those could run concurrently and might take about six months. Um, then we would have design, zoning and design approvals um, in front of this board, say in the summer. Then the city of St. Paul would do site plan review. We would issue a certificate of design compliance and construction would begin. What we're looking for from the comp plan is a plan that preserves the Capitol building's direct relationship to open space, public and visitor views of the Capitol from the West, and preservation of Leaf Erickson Park um, and considering the legacy of how it has been used in the past and how it will in the future. So we look forward to engaging with everybody in these conversations, 
um, figuring out whether a rulemaking process will be needed, whether comprehensive plan amendments will be needed. Um, we're still finding out what flexibility still remains um, in the project design. Um, and it's our goal to stay in step with the project timeline to the best we can that the House um, hopes to see this advance at. Thank you. Thank you. A quick clarifying question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in the uh, new design, as it invades the Ferguson Park, how is that in context of the statue itself? The statue itself um, could remain in place. It would it would be much closer to um, that northern edge of the addition. But there would still be green space around the a, a little bit. Yeah. May I ask yeah, Representative Cleveland? Thank you. Of these 40 events, I, I've been to many events in the yeah. park, but they've all been political in nature, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, my question is when we think about the community as a whole, I mean, you mentioned two uh, events there that were for recreational purposes. Do we know the breakdown between, I mean, the benches, I believe, have been removed from this park, even, right? So the question is, can we, if this expansion goes forward, can we create in the Capitol Mall complex a truly inviting space for the public to use? I mean, I was only half joking a moment ago when I said the Capitol Lawn would be better for croquet than yeah. Lee Fair yeah. Park. I mean, so um, the question is, if it's not that... I can understand the concern about eliminating the park or the expansion of the building, but could we create a more inviting space with other lands that are in the mall complex uh, that would be really on the mall, right. as opposed to just this pass-through space that it's currently used to get to the parking garage or the Capitol State Office building or to the train station. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in, in attending some many of those political events that happen there, what I have found to be my experiences have been really hot, really wet. <laughs> uh, it's uh, not really an inviting space to attend a rally. You can't hear, you're dodging traffic. So I would like us to think about um, a real unique community engagement for a space in the Capitol. Yeah. That's what, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for those points. Um, first, I'd say that we're we're hoping um, that we will be able to engage in updating our 32 year old um, Capital Mall uh, design framework, which sets out kind of all the all the goals and objectives for design and use of the Capital Mall and adjacent spaces that will undertake that in the next year. And that would include kind of reevaluating how, how the mall itself is used um, and what types of events can be there. Um, that would also include looking at the Lee Erickson Park space. Um, but the question you raise is exactly the kind of conversations we're hoping to start having uh, with the design team um, and other people. I would say the Lee Erickson Park is envisioned as a comp plan is um, is distinctive in that it's um, not just a park for the capital and say political events, it would be for the community as well. Right. And I think there are a lot of opportunities um, to really think about the design, how it is being used, how it could be used. And Peter, do you want to add anything to that? Lots to add to that. This, this is a big opportunity for us. The rigor, we just to reiterate, I think Kepler sees the need for this addition and this project. The footprint uh, and the rigor of that, I think what we see is that the equal amount of rigor should be put into that public space into an address of the comp plan and those needs, what the overall intent is and need for uh, gathering is on the outside of the building, which I think was next anyway with them. That's where we're at. And we definitely would, I think that's a huge opportunity to make sure we get this right. Um, I, I can't speak for Speaker Hortman, but Speaker Hortman is a strong supporter of the green space. And, uh, and I understand, I understand that. Um, 
it's about uh, it's about a balance, right? And then um, in looking at the photos that you presented earlier, and then reading the beautiful thing about a seven hour debate last night is I actually have to read the whole comp plan. So while I'm very new, um, I think the speaker, and again, I'm not speaking for her, but in my conversations with her about this appointment, um, her in envisionment, I believe, of the new wing for the state office building is for that wing to truly be a public space. And I have only briefly looked at the designs um, portion of it. And the uh, inclusion of rooms that open to the Capitol to do just that, to make sure that the the importance of the work that is done in that wing, whether it's interacting with democracy at the Secretary of State's office or committee rooms or whatever, is to constantly allow the public to have that space and also to see the Capitol in plain sight so that we are all reminded that anything that happens in demo that democracy space is about the people's house. It's about the people's government. And even the committee rooms that are designed in that space or for the, uh, the members of the community who are there to be able to see the Capitol as that important work is happening. So I think it's not um, taking away a public space, it's creating a different public space. I, I think that's how I would say it. And then making sure that the green space that we need and we all want is also incorporated somewhere in that design. Mm -hmm. So. And I really appreciate that. I think we're going to have a lot, a lot, a lot more opportunities um, uh, to have a conversation about this. And I think a shared value that all of us have is making sure that the Capitol is accessible, exactly. that the state office building is accessible um, as well. And I'm just, I'm eager to have them. I am also super conscious of time. Um, and no, all good. Yep. And uh, let's let us. Um, if you have additional questions or things that you also want to share, just please continue to reach out to uh, Ms. Clapp Smith. Um, and anything else you want to add before we? Yeah, just very move quickly. Yeah. Um, so lots more work to do. Uh, we're hoping to engage with the design team and the project leaders throughout the coming weeks. Um, it may be that we want to call the board back together um, sooner than we normally would to just focus on what we're learning um, and any input or things you're wondering about. Um, also, quick note the. The rules that we have around design of buildings um, are pretty flexible. We have flexibility in materials. We have flexibility in whether it has to be a traditional architectural form or can it be a modern architectural form. So our, you know, our body isn't dictating um, a lot of standards or precision around what precisely it needs to look like. Um, so there is there's room there from our standpoint in what the design what the design of the building is. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just say, like as a as a note um, for folks that um, as a recovering uh, state representative, um, <laughs> I would just note I think one of the something of great importance uh, is safety for members oh. and the yeah. public, and just want to name that as we are thinking through um, this entire this entire process. So chair's prerogative, I'm gonna make sure that I, I just, that. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, to that point, um, and we don't speak about this often publicly, even though I know this is a public meeting, but there are many of us, uh, myself included, who have received credible mm -hmm. death threats. We have evacuation plans of our homes. This is a legislative time unlike any other before. Yep. So it, uh, thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Governor and Chair for bringing that point forward. Okay, thank you. Um, so as has been shared with you all, the new administrative rules on commemorative works uh, took effect in November. So exciting, congratulations. Um, it is uh, it is like the nerdiest of us and the best of us all in, in one place. And I am so, I'm so happy. So thank you all again for the a tremendous amount of work um, that went into into this um, 
the development and the approval. Um, really appreciate you. You went above and beyond, um, Executive Secretary, to shepherd these through um, and to really give a process to, you know, where one did not exist uh, previously. And I feel very confident about the um, the the folks uh, whose fingerprints, frankly, was was all over this. It really looked like Minnesota and this um, wonderful. So um, I'm hoping you can give us, uh, I'm hoping you can give us just a brief update yeah. um, on this process. But you don't, um, not expected to be able to read all this, but this just shows you um, the web page that we now have around the new commemorative works rules and the application process. Um, so we now have three different application pathways that people can take. They can apply uh, to propose a new work. They can apply to propose modification of an existing work or propose consideration of removing a work. Uh, we have added um, a step before an application would be made where uh, potential applicants are strongly encouraged to get in contact with us, what we call early inquiry and consultation, where we really make sure they understand uh, what the process is of application, what their role would be moving through it, um, and that they know how to submit a complete application. So we have had a couple of early inquiry conversations um, about two different items, and we're waiting to see whether applications will move forward. But uh, we're really excited. And if any of you look at this information and think, oh, they, I have a question, they should cover it in the FAQs or whatever, please let us know. It's, it's really exciting to have this done and, and be able to have it out there. Wonderful. Any questions? There's applause on the screen. Very exciting. Um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, so 2022 is quite a year for the board, um, and there are a few highlights uh, displayed here. Um, my heart grew three sizes when these little girls saw this, the statue of Nellie Stone Johnson. Um, it's really powerful, uh, really important day. Um, some of those highlights, of course, are, um, are right here in front of us. Um, executive secretaries or anything else that you, um, any reflections that you care? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just have two slides here to remind everybody the great stuff that happened this year. So, of course, um, Nellie finally joined the Capitol Collection. It was a wonderful event. Uh, we also, in the top right, um, had the upgrade and modification of the Minnesota Medal of Honor Memorial, and this was a picture of uh, the celebration day, uh, which was really something and included flyovers of the Capitol. Uh, in the middle, that's that's text um, from the judge saying that our rules were approved. <laughs> they were going to close the file, which was really exciting words for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the bottom right, just a reminder, um, I am always working closely with Brian Pease um, and people from administration on constant maintenance and upgrades of the Capitol building. And these things get down to nuts, bolts, and screws, conversations mm -hmm. um, about making sure that every detail um, is really making sure that the Capitol is maintained in a way it should be. Uh, second, we went through the review for um, a planned new mental health facility at the former Bethesda site. And we had in the top right, we've been working with the Capital Region Watershed District to map um, stormwater movement in the Capital area and opportunities to utilize stormwater as an amenity and for irrigation in the future. And that was a big workshop we had with lots of people there. Um, we're always doing permits here. Um, it varies. Peter issues um, fewer permits than he gets inquiries. He probably gets three to four times as many zoning inquiries as he issues permits, but that's that's ongoing. And then finally, just thank you to our staff, um, Laura and Peter, who work really hard. We had a brief strategic planning retreat for the next year. Um, that really helped us focus how we were going to do our work. So I want to say thank you to the board for all of your hard work and support. I hope you feel proud of your contributions. Um, and we have an even more exciting year ahead. Very exciting. Um, thank you. Any reflections from board members? Amazing work. 
wonderful. I would just say um, we are so proud of this team and of the board and all of our um, uh, advisors and the people who participated um, in um, all of the the good all the good work that we've been able to do. Um, I think sometimes folks think that the you know the cat board gets a bad rap for not being that exciting. We had a very oh. exciting um, uh, time. So tune in, everybody. Um, uh, you're missing out, but very excited. And I know um, that as we are getting ready for 2023, uh, I wanted to make sure um, that you saw our work plan and budget requests as well. So your board packet um, has proposed work plan for board staff along with a memo on additional funding um, that might benefit the board. I'm especially excited about the proposed uh, commemorative works fund, which um, we got a lot of uh, feedback from Minnesotans and community members about that particular piece. Um, Ms. Clapp-Smith, can you provide an overview? Yes, thank you. Uh, our fiscal year runs from July to June. So we are currently halfway through our 23 fiscal year. So the budget we have for this year is $365,000. You can see here how that is distributed across the expenses of our organization. Um, by and large, it's on salary and benefits, 10% uh, for the office lease, and then um, other costs going down from there. Last year, or I should say this fiscal year, um, we only had 1% for consultants, but we have a lot of big projects coming up and we're hoping um, that we get funding to bring consultants on top of with our work this coming year. Next. So again, this is smaller, but I did send a memo out with all of this information. This is our work plan um, really for all of 2023. So not the fiscal year, but the 2023 calendar year. Um, we have our regular board activities and meetings. Um, you can see where any line has kind of lines within the bar that shows things that are just ongoing activities and then solid filled or, or uh, time limited projects. Um, in operations, um, it is likely that we're going to be having an office move um, in starting in July. Um, we've been told that our lease will end, uh, and so we need to find new space. Um, so we'll be getting ready for that, which is a lot of digital filing. Uh, we did ask, and the governor's budget um, is recommending a little bit of additional funding to help us just with the rising costs of operations, but also some preparation for that move, particularly around digital filing. Um, next body of work are the ongoing design reviews that we have zoning reviews, permits. Um, a special note there is an update of our zoning and design rules. Um, this was back on the past slide number three. So under the comprehensive plan, we are required um, within you know, a couple of years of adoption of the comp plan to update our zoning rules so that they are consistent with the policies um, in the recently updated comprehensive plan. So updating all of chapter 2400 as needed to comply is quite an undertaking. Um, and so we have requested some funding to help us hire consultants and particularly some legal expertise around zoning and land use law in that update. Um, that is in the governor's budget as well. Next. Uh, our ongoing planning work. I mentioned that we would like to update our capital mall design framework. Um, that's sort of the long-term plan for the use, um, landscaping, memorials, um, all of the things that are happening on the mall and in the adjacent spaces. Um, house leadership um, has been supportive of the idea of updating this framework, and so we hope to get some additional funding with that. Um, we are always working on transportation projects, some of which you heard today, and finally our commemorative works projects. Um, and as mentioned previously, uh, there's a recommendation for, recommendation for funding that would help um, people who are going through a commemorative work activity, applicants, um, with funding as needed. A reminder that every single commemorative work activity that's happening on the campus is done through fundraising. Um, 
from individuals. They may ask the legislature for an appropriation. They may or may not get it. So a lot of what we see and has come in recently is through fundraising efforts from individuals. And that gets quite expensive. And so um, having a little additional money to help um, some applicants is important. And that's it. So lots coming up this year, we hope. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. Members, do you have any questions? And I would just um, also name, we were very fortunate to have Representative Cleborn here because uh, she's also the chair um, for uh, House, Estate, and Local Government Finance and Policy Committee. Yeah, I wondered if that was a conflict of interest. <laughs> I think it's helpful. <laughs> thank you. We all work for the good of Minnesota. That's right. right. That's right. And I think sometimes like the cap board is this thing that is over here and I'm glad that um, you're at this table. Do you know, I just want to say that really quickly. The, these agencies uh, are very important mm -hmm. to the work of Minnesotans and you bring all of you, bring the voice of uh, citizens and you bring your expertise to serve us. And we can't do what we do at the Capitol without your expertise. Absolutely. So I just say thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. Mr. McLean, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, maybe I'll be able to dive more into this on uh, the executive board, but I was not here. But I guess I just don't think the so because current office is through the cap order right now, admin building, correct? But you know, I didn't realize it was like a lease situation that could. Yeah, uh, yeah. Every every agency at the state has to pay for um, the space that they lease from the state, uh, and you know that does. It cost some money, so we had already, before we heard about um, needing to move, we had planned to ask for, um, to be approved for a smaller lease and less space, because we do work from home some of the days, and we really need every little bit of our budget to pay for the work we do. Um, so, yes, it's, it's looking for a new space that we think we can justify the expense for our budget for. Well, here's to 2023. Um, let's uh, continue to move forward. Mr. Musty has provided a memo on a conditional use permit to allow for rooftop solar installation at St. Paul City School. Um, Mr. Musty, if you could explain it to us briefly. Yes, slide. Could you advance this slide? Um, actually, there is one slide with the photo of the rooftop array. It may be the next slide. Sorry, here. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> so this is pretty straightforward. Um, in, in our rules, we require conditional use permit for installation of solar PV equipment. It's in case it's placed in an inopportune or a visible site where we would prefer it not to be. In this case, this is similar. Uh, these things on top of the new gymnasium. Um, by the way, the school has opened. In the fall, it's very exciting to have that sound in, in mm -hmm. back in the capital area to have a school open a block from the campus. And um, it's really transformed the corner of Marion and the university. Um, and with all of the paperwork they have for actually running first year in that school, um, they missed the idea that it could be something we'd want to approve. And so, yes, it's a paperwork item. To approve a solar array, uh, it is a very similar uh, to what the state has set precedent for on their buildings, which is a low profile ballasted system. It's removable, but it is there to serve to give power to the school. Um, so it is essentially invisible from the street, and in that manner, it meets our criteria for not impacting, um, as we've outlined in the memo. Uh, analysis is that it is not really impacting negatively neighbors or uh, the overall capital area. So what we are proposing and suggest our support is approval of a conditional use permit for solar array. A um, couple of points, potential, I, I do not have the percentage of power that it will generate for the school. Um, but I know we'll contribute. It's out on top of the new gym. 
um, there are views over to the capital from from the school. And um, like I said, it's invisible to neighboring projects. And we will move to the slide for the resolution. Thank you. This is kind of a no brainer, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move adoption. The producer is Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, any discussion? Um, we'll do this vote and then I may need to step out for a moment. Right. Okay. Um, I will now take the roll, Ms. Badgerow. Aye. Dr. Bean. Aye. Ms. Felton. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Mr. Yang. Aye. And as a chair, I vote aye. It is approved. Aye. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's not here in my representative Cleborn. Hi. <laughs> All right. It is approved. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you, Ms. Badgerow, in your uh, role here in a moment as vice chair to uh, take the role of the meeting minutes of approval. But first, I may believe that uh, Mr. Busty has um, some additional information he'd like to share with us. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Vice Chair. The updates we have for you in the board memo number nine include updates again on the Sears site, the new hospital. Um, you can read more about the opening of the St. Paul City School uh, last fall and the status update on planning projects such as stormwater study for the BRT and for BRT and for the interstate and rethinking the down in, in a the component called the downtown Park, which is for downtown St. Paul. Rethinking I-94. The quick way to summarize Sears site uh, redevelopment or the, the former steer site redevelopment progress is that we remain in contact and they have moved from a paused status uh, to a status of actively marketing the site um, the marketing drawings they've recently posted publicly um, and they are working with a, a company local company to, as a broker a Seritage is working with a, a local broker uh, are included in your memo and they are online and available to everyone. But we have also placed those in the, in the memo. And you will see that the vision rendered is still uh, in, the, in the spirit aligned with the mixed urban village vision in the community framework of our town plan. So we will update you regularly uh, on this project via email and board meetings on the progress as it goes. But uh, once a sale happens, there may be more uh, Picking up with more movement uh, fairly soon. So stay tuned is the, is the update on Sears. I would interject that I searched diligently through the Collier site and I cannot find the list. Okay, so the, the, the link may have changed. I will research that. For you. Thank you. Um, so other notes there. Sarah just listed the site with Collier's. It was actually late October, early December. Listing doesn't identify sale price, um, and uh, we have explained the, the, the vision to them, and they are understanding of what the uh, the framework is. And um, when we receive inquiries, um, we will give them the same information for all different types of inquiries. That come in. Okay. Yep. Right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I will um, move on to one more update with the new hospital. So thank you, Eric. Regarding the new hospital, former Bethesda Hospital site, today we have project manager Christian Thonbold, i sorry, Paul Onifer, and other representatives, if you have any questions. Um, uh, however, given the recent conversations and reviews we have had with their team, they seem to be well on track. Cap board continues to monitor the work um, that their design team is going through, both to help them move sit through city reviews, but also to watch for compliance uh, with, uh, with your approvals in August. The timing on the slide translates to removal of the existing structure at Old Hospital this summer, completion and opening the second half of next year. So, and so Madam Vice Chair, are we using vice chair? I think we are. Or vice. 
I would, Madam Vice. <laughs> <laughs> Turn this back over to you to facilitate any questions about any of the other projects, if there are any for board members. Any and questions? Any questions for the, the team that has dialed in from Fairview to the other hospital? Well, once again, fabulous staff work, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I understand we no longer have a quorum, and so we will move the approval of the minutes until next meeting, if that's all right. Oh, Do we yes. have the board members necessary online. So, right. Thank you. So we'll Bye. move it to next. Uh, is there anything else for the cap board in this meeting? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Uh, just. Uh, okay, the meeting is adjourned. Awesome. The device has that authority. I don't think we have a quorum to adjourn. To adjourn. Right. Oh, well, that's the same thing. How about some lunch? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. With Thank you to attendees that are dialed in as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Get, get turned.